We have interrupted this program for a special broadcast from Cape Canaveral. We switch now to the Cape, CBS News correspondent Robert Trout reporting. This is Cape Canaveral, where for hours on end now, astronaut Alan Shepard has waited alone, locked into the tiny Mercury capsule on the nose of the Redstone rocket. Normally, Shepard was to push himself feet first into the ton-and-a-half spacecraft about two hours before the 83-foot-high cylinder roared into the sky 115 miles up, according to the schedule, and 290 miles out into the blue Atlantic. Following this schedule, the tall gantry tower moved back on its tracks nearly three hours ago, leaving the white redstone standing alone, like a monument of the space age. A gleaming white column striped with black and decorated near the top with black checkerboard squares. Above, like a pedestal, the small black capsule, something shaped like, a, like an inverted cone. And above it, a thin spire of red, the escape rocket, to pull the capsule away if there should be trouble. The whole column, 83 feet high, fuming and steaming with its clouds of liquid oxygen and coated partly with ice formed by the low temperature of the oxygen. But an hour or so after it moved away, the gantry rolled up to the rocket again. Clouds, which had drifted over the bright, mostly clear sky, had forced a short wait before the launching. And then during that pause for the weather, mechanical trouble was discovered in the Redstone Mercury. A little more than half an hour ago, the gantry tower for the second time was moved away. Through it all, as the dawn came up out of the ocean, fringed in low-hanging salmon-colored clouds, as the planets faded and the, st the sun stole the brightness from the clusters of electric lights on the launching pad, Alan Shepard, encased in his cumbersome pressure suit, has remained in the capsule, on his back, on his contour couch, busy with his laboratory of complex instruments, going through the motions he's often gone through in practice sessions, talking to the control center, He's been busy, but he would not be human if he did not feel the strain. Certainly for us who have stood on watch through the night, who wait now through the suspense-filled delays, these last few hours have been the most gripping of all. For Alan Shepard, commander in the United States Navy, 37 years old, is alone. One man, backed up by a team of 10,000, backed up by the most elaborate devices that science can invent, but still, one man, alone in a tiny shell on top of a rocket. Through the sky, helicopters buzz on their lazy-looking way. Their flashing red and white lights, now that the night has gone, have vanished. They wait, as do the rescue vessels just offshore that have been practicing their maneuvers in the waves for days now, clearly visible from the beach. Brown-gray rabbits dodge from time to time among the green beach shrubs that spring from the tawny sand of the Cape. Fishing birds, peppery little sandpipers, and long-legged cranes go about their occupations of searching for food, and pelicans occasionally float past in long, looping lines, able to fly when they please, without any bother about dials and switches and coils and computers. Announcements are made from time to time as the countdown draws close. Now we switch to Herb Kaplow at the forward medical area. Prepare to take off at this moment to circle about in the eventuality that astronaut Shepard must be ejected early in the flight and that the capsule will land in the immediate vicinity of Cape Canaveral or in the waters just offshore. There are relatively few people here, but those that are here are ready to act if something goes wrong and the astronaut has to be brought back here for treatment. Medical facilities are in this former Bomar lockhouse. Among the few people standing somewhat nervously here now, is First Lieutenant Dolores O'Hara, the 27-year-old Air Force nurse who has been working with the astronauts. She attended Shepard early this morning in Hangar S. Miss O'Hara of Portland, Oregon, has been holding beads, counting the rosary. Herbert Kaplow at the forward medical area. Tea time minus some six minutes now. The countdown growing very low, the count growing smaller, and the tension increasing. Now to Charles Von Fremd at Mercury Control. The future scene is in New York's Yankee Stadium, Chicago's Comiskey Park, or Los Angeles' Coliseum. But the 300 reporters, photographers, and technicians here are more excited and tense than any baseball fan. Reporters from all over the United States, plus 62 newsmen from 12 foreign countries, are present. Some pace about, some sit ramrod straight, staring at the launching pad where the redstone sits. A squawk box just announced, T-minus six minutes and counting. This is Charles Von Fremd at the press site. Far out at sea... An armada of ships stands by to pick the capsule out of the sea after it parachutes in. Let's go to Bob Lodge on the carrier Lake Champlain. That's on counting. Bob Lodge, 
Seems to be a rather bad signal from the aircraft carrier, the Lake Champlain, which is the largest of the vessels that are standing by at the recovery area, about 300 miles, the center of it is, about 300 miles out into the Atlantic. We're getting a signal now from the Lake Champlain, but it isn't really quite good enough to switch you to it. Perhaps you heard the voice that came on in the background just as I made that switch to the aircraft carrier. That was the official on the loudspeaker conducting the countdown, and he said... T minus five and counting. That means T. T for time. Five minutes to go before the fire is put in the tail, as the rocket men say, and the redstone mercury goes up into the sky with a man in it for the first time. Beside that thin white cylinder that is the redstone stands a tall structure known as a cherry picker here. The kind of device used in cities to wash and change lamppost lights, but built on a giant scale. Its bucket rests beside the capsule. The astronaut, if he should have to escape from the craft at the last moment before the launch, could leap into the cherry picker bucket, and then the entire structure, remote controlled, would move away. Assuming that all goes well, the cherry picker should move away under its electronic controls a minute before the fire lights at the rocket's base and the redstone mercury springs to life. T minus three and a half. We've waited since two o'clock in the morning here at Cape Canaveral. The sky was filled with stars. The moon never looked brighter. It seemed to be the kind of night when everyone was saying to everyone else, really, this is the night for a trip to the moon. And the moon seemed to grow even more silvery, every detail even more crystal clear as the sun came up into the sky and the stars faded. T minus three. Three minutes and counting. Through it all, hours on end, the astronaut in his pressurized suit has stayed there inside the cabin. He is in communication with that control center. He will be in communication after the launch, too. Of course, then he will be talking through the air by means of radio. At the moment, he is uh, connected directly with a number of uh, cables and leads that go in through the side of the capsule. Now, T minus two and a half. The moment draws closer. T minus two and a half. The sun is so brilliant now that the sky is fading. The sky looks almost gray, the deep blue having gone out of it. The newsmen, more than 500 from all over the world, waiting here beside our headquarters, which are set up in a trailer on the sandy beach at Cape Canaveral. Not quite the beach, just a bit in from the beach. The newsmen in especially built bleachers, watching with binoculars and telescopes and with their own naked eyes, waiting for this moment. There is no newsman, newsman here from the Soviet Union, one could have applied, or more than one could have applied. There were no special rules against a Soviet Union newsman coming here to Cape Canaveral to see this launching, but they pointedly ignored it. Of course, in the Soviet Union, news is not used as a means of communication. News is a weapon in the Soviet Union, as a colleague of mine once said. And we came up to two and a half minutes before tea time, and there is a delay. Holding, holding. Stand by to resume the count, please, said the voice on the loudspeaker of the official inside the control center, a gray building just to the right of our trailer, on three banks of consoles, men are sitting tense, gazing at little flashing lights, looking at rows of buttons, their hands shooting out from time to time, ready to throw switches. At least one of the three prime astronauts, Virgil Grissom, is supposed to be in that control room at the moment, wearing a headset which he is able to plug in at any time to any part of the apparatus and to uh, give his assistance. Minus two minutes, 40 seconds and counting. They went back 10 seconds, I think, I think, and resumed the count, not at 2.30, but at 2.40. Not very much time now for the man who remains in his chute in the capsule. He's wearing a white space helmet. Usually, during the rehearsals, at least, when he has uh, simulated these flights, he's kept the visor open until the last moment when he climbed feet first into the capsule. There's not much room for him in there. It's filled with miles of wiring and many, many instruments. The purpose of this flight, of course, is to see just what a flight into space does do to a human being. Minus two minutes and counting, the telemetry recorders are on, says the voice in the loudspeaker. The telemetry is the system of communications uh, with the people on the ground now and after the rocket does go into the air. Usually it means the instruments which are monitored by people on the ground and does not refer to the voice broadcast that will be made by the astronaut himself. 
This capsule has gone off before, of course, uh, not into orbit. T minus one and a half now. Counting. It carried a chimpanzee. It has also carried instruments, and it has carried, uh, well, instruments and oxygen, I should say, into space. But this is the first time, of course, minus that a man seconds. will go up. Minus 80 seconds. Minus 80 seconds. Overhead, two airplanes circle about occasionally. Minus Maybe you can hear seconds. their roar. Minus 70 seconds in the air. They are, I believe, called F-106. They too are flown by astronauts, but not one of, not among the first three astronauts. They're among seconds, the seven astronauts. 60 seconds and counting, says the voice. These two wing-swept planes look a bit like wild geese in the air, or perhaps one minute like and counting. pelicans because of the geographical area in which pelicans are so profuse here in Florida. And these two planes, we understand, are to do their best to stay as close as they can to the rocket and the capsule and top the rocket after the redstone is fired. It should be now just about 30 seconds. When it comes close to the time... T-30 seconds. T-minus 30 seconds. In a few moments, I will cease speaking here at our CBS radio microphone and let you hear the end of the count direct. There'll be a few seconds pause, I think, and in a moment or two, here it is. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. You don't hear the sound yet, but we see the flame. Very slowly, majestically, the red stone rises into the sky. It's man invisible inside the capsule, and a flame clearly seen like a beaming light, like a searchlight, focused down at the earth again as that thin, thin pencil goes slowly, slowly up into the clear sky, and now the sound grows louder and louder and swallows everything. Okay, the latest word on the loudspeaker. The rocket went through a white cloud. It took a bit of time for the sound to reach us back here. We could see the sight first. The trajectory is okay, says the loudspeaker. There'll be communications now back and forth between the man in the capsule and the control center here on the ground. And I think you can hear them in the background as I'm speaking to you. From time to time, we'll try to bring them to you directly. Seven reports the mission is still A-OK, full go. I'm sure you heard that. I'll stop talking whenever I hear in my earphone that an announcement is being made on this loudspeaker system and into our CBS radio news system here at Cape Canaveral. The rocket's in the air. The sound has all but died away. It went into a cloud and slowly... Freedom 7 in voice communication with the Mercury Control Center. Freedom 7, that's the call station. Report 3.5G, cabin pressure holding fine. Cabin pressure holding 5.5 pounds per square inch. The G, of course, refers to gravity. G, one G is the gravity, is the pressure on a person at the surface of the Earth. The pressure increases as the rocket goes up, and then it the falls away to nothing. The is still A-OK. -okay. The pilot is in good voice communication with Mercury Control. Mercury Control making those announcements, as you can hear. Freedom 7 with astronaut Alan B. Shepard reports the fuel system is go. 4G, cabin 5.5 pounds per square inch, oxygen go, all systems go. Go. Go means in the rocket men's parlance that everything is fine. It's either go or it's no go. Pilot reports tower jettisoned. The escape tower has been astronaut shot off. A-OK. A-OK. Periscope coming out. The escape tower not needed. It was jettisoned, as you heard the control say. I'm trying to get in a word to tell you that freedom... Turn around started, assuming orbital attitude. The capsule, free now, is turning around, powered by the rocket. He's going to hand control movements now. This is to test the pilot in flight. This is the basic purpose of the flight, to see what a man in space can do by himself taking control of the switching capsule. Switching to manual control of the pitch attitude. Pilot switching to manual control. The attitude refers to the position of the capsule in space. I'm still trying to tell trajectory you... Trajectory looks A-OK. -okay. 
Trajectory A-OK, -okay, as you heard. Freedom Pitch Control A-OK. -okay. Sooner or later, I'll be able to tell you about Freedom 7. Switching to manual yaw. Yaw refers to the sort of odd pitching rolling motion that a, sh a ship at sea sometimes makes. Medical monitor in mercury control reports pilot's condition appears to be excellent. The pilot is wired up. Taking over manual control of the roll attitude. The pilot taking on still another job in space. Controlling the roll of the ship. The capsule, that is. Roll is okay. The medical reports are sent back know. automatically. What a beautiful view is a quote. That's a quote from the pilot, Alan Shepard. What a beautiful view. Waiting tensely here on the ground for further reports from control. Pilot reports three to four tenths cloud cover along the eastern coast of the United States, obscuring the eastern coast up through Cape Hatteras. It's a long view to see Cape Hatteras from above the coast of Florida, or at least the Atlantic Ocean just off the coast. He's headed eventually for Grand Bahama Island, one of the northern islands of the Great Bahama Group. Pilot reports assuming retro attitude, initiating retro fire sequence. The retro rockets, as you heard, being... Pilot reports mission very smooth. No explanation needed. Freedom 7 is the call letters or the call name of the radio station in that capsule. It was selected by the seven astronauts themselves. At last I managed to say it. Freedom 7, the name of... Retro the... rocket number 1 has fired. The name of the Mercury capsule, and you can Retro hear... Retro number 2 has fired. You can hear the story of the rockets, one after the other. Retro number 3 has fired. The retro... The retro rocket slowing down the craft, preparatory to re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. to jettison the retro rocket pod. The pod will contain the used parts of the rocket. We are still receiving excellent voice communication from the pilot. Alan Shepard talking all the time to Mercury Control. The medical monitor reports everything A-OK -okay in the cockpit. The medical monitor is the automatic device or a series of devices attached to the pilot's body. Waiting now for a moment, I thought the Mercury Control would come in with another announcement. And the last thing I want to do is to blank out something that the control might be about. The retro rocket packet has jettisoned. The retro rocket packet has been jettisoned. The retro rocket packet falling into the sea. Strangely enough, the actual redstone booster should go farther out into the Atlantic than the capsule itself. The booster, though, of course, will be lost. It will not be... There will be no attempt made to... The mission is now six minutes and 40 seconds old. Astronaut Alan B. Shepard is still talking to us, working like a test pilot, reporting facts and figures, reporting procedures in the precise engineering manner of a test pilot. And, of course, a test pilot is just what all these astronauts really are, even though they are breaking new territory, going out of the atmosphere into space doing today things that all of them have practiced doing many times, but of course a rehearsal... Beginning to roll into re-entry attitude. The voice you hear is Colonel John Powers, who... Automatic is, control system operating properly. Who is a public information officer attached to NASA, the National Space Administration, and who acts as the spokesman, really, for the astronauts themselves on this Project Mercury. He's in Mercury Control giving us these reports. We don't see him, but we hear him. And we wait for him to give us the next official report. Soon the parachute will be opening after the capsule comes down into the atmosphere. First a tiny parachute called a drogue. The Mercury spacecraft is beginning to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. We have a registration in the control center indicating five hundredths of a G, indicating the beginning of penetration. Five hundredths of a G means that Alan Shepard is beginning to lose the weightlessness that he has been going through while in space. We are still in voice communication with the pilot. While in space outside the atmosphere. Nine G coming down. Now that suddenly was quick. From no Gs at all to nine Gs. Nine times the pressure that's on a person. His words are okay. Also a critical moment for the capsule as it re-enters the going atmosphere. Going to big G now. He is still talking, saying... 
Okay. Going through the peak G period, says Colonel Powers. This is the point at which the heat really builds up on the outside of the capsule. The nose of the capsule, with the pilot riding backward now, is composed of material... Our data here at the Mercury Control Center, center at this time is excellent. The nose of the capsule is composed of material that actually burns a bit and, and falls away as a protective measure. Instead of being completely heat-resistant, it actually gives in a bit to the heat, and some of it is consumed, and therefore keeps the high temperature from going inside the cabin. 20 Gs means that Alan Shepard weighs more than 3,000 pounds in his capsule. 3,000 pounds... Pilot reports 30,000 feet on the way down. An altitude of 30,000 feet. We used to figure at school 5,280 feet in a mile, a statute mile, not a nautical mile. That's 608 oh, more or less. Pilot now talking to us via a link, radio link, at Grand Bahama Island, and we're reading him loud and clear. That means that Shepard's words... The drogue parachute has deployed. The drogue parachute has deployed. The drogue is the tiny parachute that comes out first and pulls the big red and white striped one with it. The big red and white striped parachute comes out a few moments later and is the one that actually stops the downward rush of the capsule. The small parachute makes... Pilot left... reports all systems in the cockpit A-OK -okay and operating properly. Using the small parachute first means there's less of a jolt on the capsule and the pilot and the instruments when the big parachute suddenly opens. Everyone highly encouraged here at Cape Canaveral at the controls. Everything working beautifully. Medical monitor in the Mercury Control Center reports the pilot A-OK -okay all the way. The medical control again. Although it is not an orbital flight because we just don't have rockets powerful enough and safe enough to send them out. The main out. parachute has deployed. The main parachute has deployed. The Mercury spacecraft Freedom 7 is now descending on its main parachute. And if you heard that applause, it came from hardened newsmen who heard that announcement. Now to Bob Lodge on the carrier Lake Champlain. Champlain is was that the capsule was at 7,000 feet and, quote, coming in for a landing, unquote. And as I said, just as we switched, the newsmen, about 500 of them perhaps, more or less, from many parts of the world who've seen a great many things in their careers and are not given much to display, burst into spontaneous applause when the voice of Colonel Powers told us that the parachute had opened, the capsule had gone up into space, outside the atmosphere of the Earth, had come down again on its perilous re-entry and was parachuting down toward the sea. And within view of the principal rescue, or should I say recovery ship, actually, that's a better word for it, recovery vessel, the aircraft carrier Lake Champlain. There are half a dozen destroyers out there, too, strung all around, just in case the capsule might have come down at a point that wasn't uh, anticipated, but fortunately, the capsule is coming down, parachuting at this moment uh, within full view of the aircraft carrier, the central ship in the recovery fleet. Mercury recovery forces downrange report a visual sighting of the spacecraft descending in the parachute or hanging from the parachute. We're going to make another switch now from our CBS Radio News headquarters to Robert Lodge on the carrier Lake Champlain. Uh, this is the aircraft 
Superior Lake Champlain, the, the uh, parachute and the capsule are still coming down on the horizon. They're about even with the clouds, clouds now on the horizon. We are about four miles away from the spacecraft now. It has still not uh, made its impact with the water. The uh, helicopters are about, I would estimate, halfway to the point of impact. And as we say, the space capsule has not yet made impact with the water. In that lead helicopter, ready to pick up the astronaut are First Lieutenant Wayne Coon, the pilot, and Marine co-pilot George Cox. We're now probably no more than three miles away from the uh, from the parachute. It's becoming into our. Uh, it's going to be very clear now. It's very possible that uh, the carrier will be right close to the uh, space capsule, the spacecraft, as it's being uh, recovered from the water. We have a relayed report. It should be only a matter of uh, two or three more minutes. It's swaying gently in the wind, side to side, first to one side and then the other. Uh, it's a good thing there's a naval commander inside, or uh, he might be getting seasick. The, the lead helicopter is now uh, right at the parachute. They are now hovering over the parachute and will be ready to pick him up out of the water almost immediately. 